are live on uh, youtube as well so now i am permitting everybody to inside the room introductory <coughs> You request the participants to mute your mic, please. Yeah, it's start off. Dr. Ramil, you can start. Can we start, sir? Yes. Hello, everybody. On behalf of the Tamil Nadu and Pondicherry branch of AMSI, I welcome you all to the third session of Ask Your Men. The topics for the day are implantology, salivary glands, and maxillary sinus. But before we start, the usual instructions. For smooth conduct of the program, may I request all the participants to mute your audio and disable your video. Thank you. And as usual, uh, just to remind you all, at the end of this session, you would have to take the MCQ test by Google Forms. And as mentioned earlier, this is important to receive your certificates. Also, participating in a minimum of eight sessions is mandatory for you all to receive your certificates. And for those of you who are not able to enter the Zoom meet, let me remind you all, this program is also live on YouTube. Please join us over there. And another very important announcement for today. We are overwhelmed by your enthusiastic response in interacting with us during all the sessions. However, due to constraints in time, we are unable to... Uh, may I, may I request again? May I request again to the participants to mute your audio, please? Yes. I was saying we are... Uh, completely overwhelmed by your enthusiastic response and in interacting with us during the sessions. However, due to constraints in time, <clears throat> we are not able to extend the duration of each session beyond an hour. So from this session onwards, we would take only those questions which were uploaded by you all through Google Forms, spanning an hour precisely. But don't worry, keep posting your questions over the chat columns or the Google Forms. We would compile all these unanswered questions and clarify them over an exclusive session at the end of the series. <clears throat> Rina, ma'am, and Jimson, sir, have promised that. So don't worry. Please keep posting your questions over the chat columns or the Google Forms. Would really appreciate your understanding in this regard. Moving on to today's program, let me introduce with great pleasure the mentors and moderator of the day. The mentor for implantology session is Dr. Arun Kumar, who graduated from the Savita University. With 13 years of teaching experience and numerous presentations to his credit, his areas of expertise include implantology, including zygoma implants, and niche surgical work such as TMJ arthroscopy and TMJ replacement surgery. He has also served as a joint secretary for the Tamil Nadu and Pondicherry branch of AMSI and is currently the vice president of the state association. We welcome you, Dr. Arun Kumar. The mentor for the next session, Salivary Glance and Maxillary Sinus, is Dr. Naveen Raya Kumar, who is the head of the Department of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery at SRMC. He is one of the very few oh. surgeons who practice craniofacial surgery in a prolific way. He is a fellow of the Royal College of Surgeons, Ireland, as well as Glasgow, with an impressive publication profile. Uh, it would be a great pleasure to have you here, uh, Dr. Naveen. The moderator of both the sessions is Dr. Sendil Murthy. He graduated from the Government Dental College, Chennai. At present, he is an associate professor at CSA Dental College and Hospital, and also the director of Murthy Maxillofacial and Dental Implantology Center at Madurai. He's completed various fellowships and training programs in surgery, both in India and abroad. 
He was awarded the Implantologist Award of the Year in 2018. And he's been associated with a medical institute which trains students for postgraduate entrance exams and has also authored a book for entrance aspirants. We welcome you, Dr. Sendhil. Okay, with this, we move on to today's program. Over to you, Dr. Sendhil. Uh, thank you, ma'am, for the kind introduction. It was a pleasure uh, joining in this Ask Your Mentor meeting with two of the greatest mentors of maxillofacial surgery of our Tamil Nadu and Pondicherry uh, group. So let me start with the first part of today's session, which is going to be on implantology. So I would like to request uh, Dr. Arun Kumar, sir, to come and join me with the meeting to answer the questions that are, that are going to be posed on implantology. Hi, everyone. And uh, uh, thanks, Dr. Inavinal, for uh, your uh, kind intro. And uh, let's move on, Sandal. Yes. Uh, so there are a couple of questions that have been come up in implantology. So I shall be starting with question number one, uh, which says that uh, how to do measurements in CBCT for implants and what are the things that needs to be noted? Yeah, okay. So what does CBCT mean? Is CBCT is uh, nothing but cone beam computed tomography and it's the most advanced diagnostic imaging tool for accurate or uh, for advanced diagnostic imaging for uh, accurate boning measurements. When we need to do a bony anatomy evaluation or for placing an implant, then we need to assess uh, the ridge, the, we need to get the uh, amount of uh, bone. So CBCT is important for planning in two ways. One, diagnostic, where we can assess the anatomical boundaries. Two, we can, we can try to identify any pathologies which is not seen in these uh, OPG or two-dimensional uh, x-rays and CBCT plays a very big role in treatment planning where you can evaluate the bony dimensions and also for uh, uh, doing a prosthetically driven implant placement which is now the need uh, worldwide and uh, so when, with the help of CBCT you can uh, try to get the rich dimensions we need to examine whether we have enough width and the height so probably if we yeah this is an uh, image where you can see that the width of the anterior part of the maxilla and uh, the height from the crestal ridge to the nasal floor and that's a cross-sectional uh, view of the same uh, same uh, same image where it shows the nasal the canal there basically see it helps us understanding the anatomy of the region and the dimensions of the available. So, we'll go to the next. Yeah. So, location. Okay. So, what are the uh, anatomical structures uh, depending on the different parts of the ears? In the anterior maxa, we need to look out for the nasal flow, the nasus, the PSA, maxillary tuberosity, and pterygopalatin fossas. And in the mandible, The anterior mandible, yes, the incisal foramen, the mantle foramen, and the lingual foramen. So basically what we need to do is once we identify these anatomical landmarks, we can avoid placing the implants into these uh, uh, anatomical or into these uh, uh, causing any damage to the nerves. In posterior mandible, we, we can identify the mandibular canal. We can draw the uh, entire canal along so that we'll know to know where we can identify which region, the size, the length of the implant can be placed. and. Uh, Yes. Basically, CBCT is, oh, sorry, uh, European Association for Ossean Integration has laid down some uh, important uh, recommendations where it says that CBCT is definitely required whenever we need to do extensive bone grafting, when there is a requirement for sinus lift or elevation and evaluation of the donor sites. When, whenever we are planning for special techniques such as all on four or zygoma, CPCT is the must to get the right measurements and uh, it helps. Digital uh, implantology is done only when we have a CPCT. And we can also identify post-operative complications, whether there is nerve damage caused due to uh, either while drilling or the implant which has gone and imp uh, impinged onto the nerve. So recent advances. So the next question is, sir, about uh, what are the recent advances that are there in today's implantology? So I think uh, it's a very elaborate question. So yes, sir. <laughs> so let's move on, sir. Yeah. 
Okay, the recent advances in implantology, CS, yes. The CBCT has revolutionized the way we place implants and uh, with the help of CBCT, we can, uh, we can do a, a digital, digital planning. We can also prefabricate position. Next slide. So the other advantage. Arun, is your voice is not very clear. Uh, yes, sir. Its voice is breaking, sir. Actually. Yeah. You can hear me now. Yeah, yeah. Now, now, now it's better. Yeah. So the other advances in uh, implants are the designs. So there are various designs which are available. There is short implants which are made may mainly used in the posterior parts of the jaws. Now implants in the lower part of the mandible. Uh, anterior part of the mandible, single piece implants, whereas implants when we are doing multiple implants and when we cannot do an immediate loading, at that time we can use single piece implants. And uh, finally, we have co-access implants. So co-access implants are implants which have already been have an angulation on them, but basically this co-access implants are not available in India right now. I think there is a request to raise your voice. Uh, it's too low. Yeah, I'll do that. Arun, sir, Arun, I think you need yeah. to come a little closer to the mic. Closer Probably. to the yeah. Okay. You can hear me now. Yeah, you can change the next slide, please. Can you change the slide? Sandra? Yes, sir. Yes, yes. So I think this is the coaxis implant that you were talking about, right, sir? Yeah, yeah. This is the coaxis implant which shows that the angulation of uh, the implants which are already incorporated, but is specifically not available in India right now. What What is the special indication? Now? What is the indication of this coaxis implant, sir? See, when we are planning implants in the posterior region, when we want to do, uh, when we want to avoid the uh, sinus lift procedures, we can we can do this type of angulated implants on them. Yeah. So you can reduce the amount of uh, uh, distal can. Go to the next slide, please. Yes. Yeah. The other advances in uh, are the materials. So we, this is called the new gen implants or new generation implants uh, because these implants have nano coatings on them. And uh, there is a, there's a company called a Zolid, uh, there's a technique called a Zolid technique which uses multi-layer protein matrix of fibrinogen, which is added to the metal surface of an implant. And when this comes in contact with body fluids, it releases drug particles. So what is the importance of that? This is it's a bone and reduces the risk of bacterial infection and also reduces the healing uh, healing time. Then we have zirconia implants and uh, the other is peak. Peak is polyether ether ketone, which is a thermoplastic, which has high resistance to abrasion, hydrolysis, and is quite biocompatible too. Then the other advances are uh, earlier we used to use external hex. Now external hex is available still with zygoma implants and then internal hex which has got uh, that's, that's the external hex which you see there and this is the internal hex which could be hexagonal in shape widely used then which is then the concept of MOS taper is still, uh, still there actually MOS taper provides a stable interface it is used in uh, it is used to attach jet engines to wings of airlines so there's a small, about 1.49 degrees. The main idea of MOS taper is it is not a, a screw retained, it's not screwed in, where you place the abutment on the implant and you tap it and it gets locked with the surface friction there. The idea of this is it eliminates microgens, micro gaps and uh, provides a good hermetic seal. And then finally, the latest what we, we all, all implantologists use are this is platform switching. Platform switching is a 
method which refers to placing of a abutment of a narrow diameter on an implant which is of a wider diameter rather than placing the abutments of similar dia so that's refers to platform switching so what happens by this way the pressure the, the we uh, it helps in preserving the marginal alveolar bone and also reduces the risk of bacterial infection along the call of the implant and uh, definitely yes platform switching gives a better healing color healing margins of the color of the implant so out of the four which connection do you think is ideal for uh, today's implant uh, treat like for posterior implant which one would you recommend for your patients yeah, if you are going to do single or multiple platform switching is definitely the most widely used because one uh, uh, the the collar attachment soft tissue attachment integration is very good with that and also the marginal bone is well preserved so you have the forces which are delivered from the abutment to the implant to the center point so all this platform switching is much better in that way okay sir so yes again uh, now uh, the other recent advances uh, in implant are the digital era so from taking impressions with rubber based materials we have moved on to taking digital impressions which is uh, which you, by which you can sle models then you, you have the cbcts and also cat cam processes which helps us in uh, yeah this is cbct this is the machine which we can take we can prefabricate uh, implant guides the help of these so what's what's the help of with the help of these uh, 3d uh, imaging and uh, uh, the digital impressions a static guide or a prefabricated splint can be made by which we can precisely position the implants in a prosthetically driven uh, uh, implant placement the other uh, advances are yes the dynamic navigation implantology uh, what is dynamic navigation implantology this is where we can literally visualize the placement uh, on a navident so this sums up what is about the digital implantology you can you can see the images where yeah they are okay the concepts all on four yes developed by polomolo uh, uh, it uses just four implants where you can give uh, routing teeth with distal cantilevers and it, it, there's a lot of uh, numerous uh, papers journals which are available uh, which shows success uh, of all on four and then zygoma implants when we have deficient bone uh, in the posterior maxilla zygoma implants comes a choice and then yeah patient specific implants today's surgeons many of the surgeons prefer uh, patient specific implants this is not but a subcarotid implant but there is no osh integration of the implant which occurs in uh, patient specific implants how it is fabricated with the help of a cbct sle models are uh, made and uh, these uh, patient specific implants are printed and uh, you can you can insert it you can try it on these models prior to putting on the patient the advantage of doing that is we can immediately uh, once the surgery is done you can immediately place these implants and you can uh, load it but there is a disadvantage using these patient specific implants early i don't know whether we get screw retained but it's mostly cement retained uh, which is available and there's no osh integration occurs okay sir so i think uh, that answered the elaborate question of the various recent advances so uh, it was very elusive and comprehensive so that you had completed all the aspects of uh, recent developments that are there in implantology so moving on to the next interesting question which is on basal implants so which one is preferable immediate loading or delayed loading in basal implants uh, so okay by the name uh, it's a, it says basal implants uh, or it's always called as cortical implants and uh, basal implants engage the basal bone or the cortical bone you can see the picture there it shows that uh, the threads are there only in the lower part of the implants and uh, in basal implantology it, there is again no osh integration which occurs 
because it's a purely a cortical implant, which is. So, uh, how, okay, the question, answering the question, whether we need to immediate load or not. See, it depends on when, if you have engaged the cortical part of the pterygoid plates. If many, uh, many implantologists, when they do it, if they use a shorter implant, they end up putting the implant in the tuberosity, maxillary tuberosity. So that is not a compact bone. That is not, uh, you have a softer bone in that, and it's called tuberosity implants. A basic uh, pterygoid implant, uh, the yeah, we are, we are in, we are in the basal implant question. So, so I think we are in the basal implant. Of yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, okay. Sorry, the basal implants, okay, okay. Sorry. It, uh, yeah, immediate loading, we are talking about immediate loading. Yeah, okay. It is always recommended. Okay, when you place basal implants, uh, again, basal implants are not uh, osseo integrated. And when you use, it can be used for single implants to multiple implants. You can use it. Basal implants, but the ideally, what you need to do is you need to splint all these implants for the processes for a better load distribution. And uh, <clears throat> uh, the one disadvantage with basal implants is that it is only cement retained. Uh, uh, it is cement retained. So when if you want to remove it, when you want to retrieve it, it becomes a challenge because it uh, it's very difficult to remove cement retained process. We know that if there is if you want to change the process at a later part or if one of the tooth is chipped off. That becomes a difficult point. So the advantages of basal implants over conventional implant is a never-ending debate, sir. So I think uh, it is purely based on the operator's choice to use the implant system that they would prefer is what I feel is the right answer. So coming to the next question, uh, what is zygoma implant and what are the steps involved in the process of installing a zygoma implant? Okay. Uh... Zygoma implants are uh, one of the best treatment concepts when we want to rehabilitate uh, the uh, kind of when we want to rehabilitate atrophic posterior maxilla, and it was introduced by Brennemark in the year 1988. It was an option as a non-grafting method, and it's in functional rehabilitation. The other uh, the other indications where we want to use uh, okay we go on to the zones okay there is uh, Bedrosian classification. This is a, Bedrosian classification, which says that zygoma implants are indicated when there is deficient or no bone in the zone two and zone three, that's a posterior maxilla. So if you have sufficient bone, then the other treatment options come in, like you can use an all and four, you can go in for traditional implants, you can do kind of lip procedures too. What are the steps involved? That is a question, I suppose. Yes, sir. Before, uh, yeah. So I've already told about this indications. Indications, yeah. Atrophic maxilla where all the grafting methods have, uh, we have tried all the other types of grafting methods or failed implants in the posterior maxilla, then zygoma implants are indicated. Okay, there's two ways where we can place a zygoma implant. One is intrasinus and the other is extrasinus method. What you can see is the image here is, it's an intrasinus method where a small window is created on the anterior of the wall of the maxilla. You lift the uh, sinus lining and uh, once the bone is created and they lift the sinus, sinus then you use a round burr. Once, what is uh, the desired depth of the burr and the length is already done by planning in the CBCT scan. And then you use the depth gauge indicator to assess whether we have reached the uh, enough depth which we have pre-planned it and using a pilot drill bits through this uh, uh, troca sleeves. And once you've drilled it to the desired depth, you again check it with an angulated depth gauge. And finally, you place the uh, you place the zygoma with the zygoma handle. Interestingly, if you see this image, the zygoma, the abutment head the, uh, has gotten 45 degrees angle. This angle is created on the head of the uh, implant, mainly to compensate for the angle between the zygomatic bone and the maxillary bone. So these are the steps. Extra sinus, you don't need to create a window on the zygoma, on the anterior wall of the maxilla. You directly go and just lateral to the uh, zygomatic buttress and you engage the zygomatic bone. The only only concept which you need to understand is whenever you're going to do zygomatic implants, uh, when it engages, you need to have a palatal emergence intraorally. So it should be drilled slightly palatal. So which one do you think is the best option? Is to do extra sinus or intra sinus? Uh, see, 
earlier we used to have a full threaded zygoma implants so full threaded zygoma implants were uh, when i started doing we had a lot of uh, uh, complications when uh, it if you tear the sinus collars so again the threads are only in the engaging part of the cortex so that doesn't matter it depends on where you want to place it where you want to get your prosthetic part where you want the uh, head emergence coming out extra sinus is is also done depends on depends on how much the patient can uh, or the how much the uh, mouth opening is there for the patient okay so again it's it's surgeon's purview okay sir okay thank you so let's move on to the next question sir i think the next question is a comparison between pterygoid implants and they have asked whether uh, pterygoid implants can be used as an alternative to zygomatic implants and what is the survival rates of pterygoid and zygomatic implants so that's a question okay see i don't know how this comparison came between pterygoid implants to zygomatic implants there are various studies which uh, by uh, bidra and uh, hyun which says the average success rate of pterygoid implants are about 90.7 and there are again various studies uh, by, for zygoma implants uh, by by candle and marty which says that the zygoma success of zygoma implants are 97.5% so see okay the difference between pterygoid and zygoma implants in pterygoid implant you need to achieve a good insertion talk you can the virus it indicated the indications are similar to what zygoma is when there is deficient bone in the posterior maxilla and uh, uh, and uh, you can whenever you want to avoid distal cantilensional implants so for example when you doing all on four implants you can use an additional pterygoid implant to uh, to get a better stability but pterygoid implants is requires a little surgical expertise and as i was telling before that if you using a shorter implant it ends up in the tuberosity so i was just telling in, in the same thing happens in even in basal implants when you want to they the basal implants are also used in, as a pterygoid implant but when it's shorter it ends up in the tuberosity which doesn't have dense bone and uh, the length of the pterygoid implant should be about 18 to 22 mm and uh, if if you don't get a stable if you don't get a primary stability yes you have to do a delayed loading for pterygoid implants okay sir okay so when you compare which one do you recommend sir zygomatic implants or pterygoid implants uh, for the posterior as it says as it says pterygoid implants are a blind procedure one of the major uh, complications with pterygoid implants are since it's blind you might end up into the pterygoid plexus of veins and uh, and produce profuse bleeding from that side which is sometimes difficult to control too and uh, that, that so widely the papers say that zygoma implants are more preferred it's got better uh, stability uh, and the advantage of zygoma implants is immediately loaded so definitely i would prefer for zygoma implants than pterygoid implants i would Absolutely. use pterygoid implants when i i am already using other conventional implants in the anterior maxilla so it becomes an additional support as i said to avoid uh, avoid distal cantilevers so the other point with pterygoid implants is uh, normally don't you think the prosthesis extends up to the third molar when you have a pterygoid implant and sometimes that might be like too long an arch of a prosthesis i, I feel that's also another drawback with pterygoid implants because the prosthesis goes all the way up to the third molars what do you think on that sir uh, if you see the emergence entry would be somewhere around the uh, first molar and the second molar region if you're going to do a, a lengthy pterygoid implant okay sir okay. so if that is going to be there with angulated abutments that shouldn't be a problem unless you are you are literally going as a vertical placement of the pterygoid implants yes and that that uh, point if the patient's mouth opening is restricted it's very difficult to give a prosthesis there you cannot do a screw retain prosthesis at all there okay sir okay so i think we move on to the next question again it's with pterygoid and zygomatic implants a loading protocol uh, can it be immediately loaded tips and tricks advantages and disadvantages okay uh, see zygoma implants were uh, invented mainly for uh, immediate loading so it says that the uh, steps which or the journals which present 
you can see that it's immediately loaded within temporary processes or temporary acrylic process within 48 hours. So that's a major advantage of uh, zygomatic implants here. So, so if again, uh, for the loading protocols, if you see the high insertion, whenever you want to do a telegard implant, you will have to have achieve a high insertion torque. And uh, why we keep on talking about pterygoid pterygoid implants, but what is the bone which we need to engage uh, in the pterygoid, uh, in the uh, dense cortical plate which we need to engage is the pyramid, pyramidal process of the palatine bone and, uh, and the pterygoid process of the sp sphenoid bone. This is the part which we get the dense cortical bone. So uh, if you don't engage this bone, then definitely we don't get a high insertion torque and then we have to delay loading process of, pro uh, of the processes. I think okay. answer, I, answer you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I, so in short, the zygomatic implants can be immediately loaded, whereas pterygoid implants loading decided by the torque of the implant that we place. If we have very good torque, then we can load it immediately or else we'll have to plan for a delayed loading. Is that right, sir? Yeah, yeah that's, that's, uh, that answers it. And uh, yeah, the torque or uh, the step, primary stability can be measured with uh, the instrument like Austell and Penguin, the ISQ. Okay. Uh, the normal ISQ is about 55 to 85 ISQs on implant uh, uh, stable quotient, it says. No? So you can measure the stability. So you can use that for the same for all conventional implants too. Okay, sir. So moving to the next question, uh, sinus lift with immediate implant placement versus sinus lift with delayed implant placement. What are the advantages and disadvantages of both and which one is the best treatment of choice? So it's a bit tricky question, I think which is the best treatment of choice, I think. Uh, okay, uh, so the question is sinus lift with immediate implant placement versus sinus Delayed lift implant with placement. placement. Okay. The, let's, let's just see what are the indications of sinus lift first. So a sinus lift is indicated when you have deficient uh, posterior uh, bone, the residual bone height in the posterior maxilla is less. And when you don't have any sinus pathology, it's in, uh, and when there is severe atrophic maxilla, and and also it is indicated when the poor bone quality and quantity in the posterior maxilla. So okay, you have two types of uh, sinus lift, whether it's a direct sinus lift and indirect sinus lift. In direct sinus lift, you create a wall on the anterior maxilla, and you need to lift the sinus just like uh, just like if you have an eggshell. That's how it's taught. Uh, initially, you need to crack it. You need to elevate the membrane out without tearing the membrane. You graft it inside. You can and then place the implant intraorally. In indirect sinus lift, various companies have come out with their own kits where you drill it uh, through the sockets to the level, so you don't break the sinus flow. You have got uh, sinus lift instruments where you can tap it gently and allow the uh, flow of the sinus to break away, and then you push the sinus. The other, uh, some other uh, implant companies do have hydraulic way of elevating the sinus flow and you can put in the bone graft and also you can go ahead with implant placement. But the main decision making of sinus flow elevation is, this is the chart which gives us very clear bone height of the posterior maxilla, which is about one to five mm, then direct sinus lift is the only method which you need to do. You cannot go in for you cannot go in for a indirect sinus lift. If you have a bone height in the posterior maxilla of between four to seven mm, then you can do an indirect sinus lift. If you have six to eight, uh, nine mm of uh, bone in the posterior maxilla, then you can use short implants. And again, with direct sinus lift, if there is only one to three mm of residual bone height, then you need to elevate the sinus, place your grafts, allow the grafts to take up, and then do the implant of, after about two to three months later. But if you do have about three to five mm of bone, then you can place the grafts and do the implant with a single step. Yes, sir. I can understand. Yeah, got it. So I think with that, let's move to the next question. Osteodensification and implants. How many millimeters can be lifted in sinus lift using densification burrs? Okay. Uh, this is a very good concept of using uh, your, your drill drills. Uh, it's called the Densa burrs. It's a universal burr. You can use it for many systems. And the main, uh, the name itself says that also uh, it was developed by Salah Hui. Uh, it's a noble uh, technique of osseous densification where non-excavation of the osteotomy occurs. But unlike traditional implants, there's a difference in the drills 
uh, drills uh, how it is uh, made. Here, when we use the drills in a clockwise direction, it cuts the bone. When you use the drills in counterclockwise direction, it condenses the bone. So here, what, what it says is, when the drilling is done, it's, it is done in a non-subtractive drilling. That is, it doesn't excavate the bone as how it occurs in the conventional implants. So this is the image which you see on the right side where if the drill moves in the counter uh, uh, implant, uh, how the implants are done. It cuts through the bone, it displaces the bone. But when you use the same denser bird in a counterclockwise direction, it causes osseodensification. It, it condenses the bone and thereby improves the quality of the bone which is available. And uh, the other name for osseodensification is hydrodynamic bone preparation, where it condenses and compaction of uh, autografting is done, and it increases the bone to implant uh, contact and enhances bone density and increases the residual strain and also increases the implant stability. So the question was like how many millimeters you can lift the sinus membrane yes. with denser burst? With yeah. denser burst, the maximum is about 3 mm with a very slow speed which you need to do it. And, GP and, and incremental, uh, incremental drilling has to be done. So the answer is 3 mm is the maximum which you can uh, uh -huh. Sinus flow. Uh, it can okay, be used okay. as an alternative to indirect sinus lift, if I am right. Is yes, it it's not, not alternative. See, uh, different uh, implant uh, companies have got their own kits. So, as I said, this is a universal uh, uh, drill. So, you can always use this as a supportive mechanism. You can, instead of using the other kits, implant or uh, the other company kits, you can use the denser burr for doing an indirect sinus lift. Okay, sir. I got it. Okay. So, the next question is, can you explain in detail about second phase in implant? Okay. I don't know. You mean second phase, the stage two implant, uh, which is the recovery phase? If yes, uh, then uh, yeah, you, you need to recover the implant, remove the uh, cover screw and place the uh, healing cap, allow the initial healing to occur uh, and then take impressions. So what is the, what's the advantage is that why you place the healing scab, a healing cap is that you get a better soft tissue attachment and also uh, uh, yeah this is the Im images which you can see that there are two there are various methods where you can do a recovery of the implant one you can go ahead conventionally open a flap then uncover the implant uh, 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 screw uh, the cover screw place a healing cap allow the gingiva to attach and then do the prosthetic part of the impression making the better method is to do is you can use a tissue punch you can just go directly onto the cover screw you can just remove that, that particular part of the gingiva which is much better less injury you need not again compromise on the blood supply which is there on the soft tissues which gives a better uh, attachment to the abutment head okay sir okay so the next question is on role of prp in implantology or platelet-rich plasma in implantology. Okay, uh, platelet-rich plasma is a uh, is a blood component which uh, where there's high concentration of platelets and uh, minimum of uh, uh, volume of the plasma. So it, how it is done? PRP is obtained by uh, centrifuging our autologous bone, uh, and uh, and uh, yeah, what is the advantages of this PRP or what what it plays? Uh, PRP is that it improves the uh, integration of the bone, it improves the healing of the soft tissues, uh, accelerates the wound healing of soft tissues. So how do we prepare PRP or uh, platelet-rich plasma is the patient blood is withdrawn uh, in a test tube which is centrifuged with an anticoagulant. The anticoagulant is acid citrate dextrose and uh, the blood, once when you centrifuge it, you find that the blood settles down at the lower part, the RBC settles down at the lower part the plasma is in the top portion and the fibrin, the platelets and the leukocytes hang on to the middle portion. So, but nowadays you see uh, implantologists prefer platelet rich fibrin, which is another blood product, which is again, uh, which is again obtained by centrifuging the blood, but here without adding the anticoagulant, that is the acid citrate dextrose. What is the advantage of PRF is that it has got better cohesive uh, unless you can uh, you get it as a jelly type, depends on how you centrifuge it, whether you spin it with a uh, centrifuge spin with RPM or angulation of the uh, tube, 
Then there are different types of PRF which is available. That is advanced, injectable, or leukocyte rich uh, PRF. So implications of PRF in implantology is that you can mix this PRF with the graft material where it makes it as a cohesive. You can squeeze it uh, and uh, place it on the graft, which allows good soft tissue healing. And also it can be used in sinus grip procedures. So this is the uh, tube which shows that the RBCs are settled in the lower part. You can see that the plasma is on the top and in between you can find that the uh, fibrin uh, and the platelets with leukocytes in, in the middle. So if you want PRF, what we need to do is once you open the cap of the uh, test tube, we can withdraw the top portion of the plasma with a syringe, then you get a jelly-like PRF. So the most advantages of PRF is that it's got high growth factors and uh, the advantage of PRF over PRP is that it doesn't have the anticoagulant. Usually that anticoagulant triggers an inflammatory response at the implant site. So I just uh, summed up what is the advantages between PRP, PRF versus PRF, PRF uh, PRP, sorry. So uh, it's one of the hot topics uh, for implantologists today. So with that, let's move to the next question, sir, on uh, short implants merits versus demerits. Yes, sometimes small is mighty too, depends on the place where we use it. Uh, Thomas Driscoll had invented the Bicon system of implants with introduction of about 8 mm implants. Uh, you get implants of also about 6 mm. It's a simple and a conservative approach. And uh, it's uh, it can be used as a uh, whenever you want to avoid grafting of the uh, uh, posterior maxilla or the mandible. And uh, it, it acts as a conventional implant. Uh, Whenever we, we want to use it as a loading uh, loading of the implant, it's, it's conventional. You need to test whether you get the primary stability and then only then you can load the implants. There are some drawbacks with these uh, uh, short implants too. The drawbacks are insufficient width. Uh, if, if you have insufficient width in the posterior part of the uh, jaws, then you cannot use uh, these implants. And uh, uh, the other drawback is that it cannot be used in the anterior zone because of the aesthetic considerations and because the implant to crown ratio is more. You have a bigger crown with a smaller implant, then the biting forces are increased and, uh, and there's less bone to implant uh, contact for osseointegration integration to occur, occur. So these are the merits and demerits of uh, using short implants. So with more and more literature coming with short implants, I think it's uh, increasing the treatment options for atrophic posterior maxilla. So I think it's definitely one of the best options for atrophic uh, posterior maxilla with the residual bone, which is less in uh, quantity. So, so the next question is about uh, uh, systemic disease considerations in implants. Yeah. So what, uh, okay, there are... There are uh, like uh, Hang has uh, laid down a lot of uh, contraindications for uh, using implants. The absolute contraindications laid down by him are recent myocardial infarction or cerebral axilla accidents. It says that if anyone has got an MI within six months to delay it, you can do implants in these patients, but do it after uh, six months. And recent valvular prosthesis or placement within two, one year, uh, you, you cannot do implants in these patients. Yes, patients, most of these patients do take uh, anticoagulants. So there's high risk of bleeding. You need to check the INR, see that the INR is below below 2 or 1.5. If the INR is more than that, we're going to get, we're going to encounter profuse bleeding and the platelet is less than 50,000. Again, you're going to, we're going to encounter severe bleeding. Uh, it, it's absolutely contraindicated in patients who are immunosuppressed, uh, sub, uh, immunosuppressions. They're taking immunosuppressed drugs or they uh, they the body, for example, for patients who are on renal dialysis or having uh, liver problems, it's, it's, it's absolutely contraindicated. And yes, we know that active cancer therapy, and yes, it's definitely no for patients who are on intravenous bisphosphonate treatments. The chart so being a very vast uh, question, sir. I think, <laughs> yeah, I think this is a very vast, you say that it depends again, you can do it on diabetes mellitus, but uncontrolled diabetes mellitus, no, but you can still control it and go ahead. Uh, patients on corticosteroid therapy, like uh, bronchial asthma or dermal, uh, if they are uh, having dermal lesions, they would be on corticosteroid therapy. So all, if they are immunocompromised, I think it's better to avoid implantology in these patients. So as you said, it's a wide thing. 
the tablet column we got a lot of uh, uh, materials which are there but apart from these absolute contraindications i think we can go ahead with an health individual surveys so i just have one question in this sir what do you think about in thyroid patients because a lot of my patients keep asking me doctor i have thyroid problem and what do you think about getting an implant and so what is your opinion on thyroid patients sir yes sir this is a very common question they first uh, even while doing an extraction action they come out telling that i have thyroid problems so you can just go and do the hormone test for thyroid thyroids if it's well controlled if it's well controlled you can go ahead use you can use hormone therapy so i think uh, arun sir's internet is slightly struck up so we've come to the last question uh, for the day in the topic of implantology which is about the role of vitamin d supplements for implant or implant success so uh, i think vitamin d is a very important for uh, bony metabolism so there is always a debate whether to go for vitamin d for implants or not uh, we all know that the major source of vitamin d is the sunlight exposure uh, although there are a lot of studies which say that vitamin d enhances bone healing there is no concrete evidence to tell that vitamin d is increasing osseo integration or in other words if there is deficiency of vitamin d there is a possibility for implant failure but again it is just a theory and there is no proven literature to support the role of vitamin d for success of implant so that is what we could get on the literature about vitamin d so i think with that we've come to the uh, fag end of the first part of our presentation and dr sendil uh, yes sir dr sendil there are few questions uh, that was in the chat box so if you can take up those questions before you go yes, to sir. the next uh, topic yes yeah. sir. yes so one of the question was about uh, angulation for zygoma implant so normally the angulation for zygoma implant there are two types of zygomatic implants one is an implant which has a 45 degree inbuilt angulation and to which normally we connect a 0 degree multi unit abutment and the other type of zygomatic implant comes with a 0 degree uh, collar where we can connect uh, multi unit abutments ranging from 45 degrees to 60 degrees so again it, it depends entirely on the anatomy of the zygoma which is usually Uh, evaluated before taking up the case for zygomatic implants i think that answers that question it's purely the anatomy of the region which decides what is the exact angulation of zygoma implant and the patient specific and basal implants are they same uh, actually no uh, basal implants are totally different and patient specific implants are totally different uh, patient specific implants means we make a stereolithographic model of the patient's jaw and we design a uh, uh, specific implant like a subperiosteal implant on the surface on a cat cam machine and then we uh, print 3d print or mill the implant prosthesis and implant and we fix it to the bone so i don't think both are the same they are totally two different uh, type of implants and uh, the other question is do pterygoid implants require cross arch stabilization like zygomatic implants yes any of these implants which are taking uh purchase from uh, distant areas it's always better to have a cross arch stabilization so like zygomatic implants it's also important to have cross arch stabilization with pterygoid but uh, pterygoid implants can also be used for single arch uh, replacements like if we have a missing premolar to uh, the distally edentulous uh, site then uh, of course we can use pterygoid implants but we need to wait for a delayed loading so the major difference is the loading protocol if you are planning for an immediate loading it is always better to have uh, a cross arch stabilization but if you are going for a delayed loading might be you can also go uh, without cross arch stabilization when it comes to pterygoid implants uh, how much jump distance buccally allogenic bone graft should be used uh, if i understand this question correctly it is a question for anterior implants in implant which is normally placed uh after extraction how much jump distance you need to graft the socket uh if anything more than 2 mm you are supposed to graft the jump distance uh, in case of immediate extraction implant placement in the anteriors 
so how helpful is prf against a low centrifuged prf so prf again uh, it is principally used for soft tissue healing the role of prf and heart tissues is very limited so th there are various companies which come up with different centrifuges and uh, the centrifuge uh, company gives us a protocol for uh, making different kinds of prf and it is important that we follow the company's protocol for fab, um, uh, for making the different types of prf so it is uh, it is not universal with all the centrifuges so that's about uh, the prf and uh, any other question I think, uh, Jim, sir, we've, we've answered fairly to all the questions that has been put on to the uh, group. Yeah. Any other yeah. questions? I sir? think in case, in case if there are any questions that are not answered, we'll take it up uh, uh, in the last session. Okay, sir. I think uh, with that... Yeah, uh, there is another question. How yes. do we come to know that zygoma implant is going in the right angulation? And what are the absolute indications of zygoma implant and pterygoid implants? Uh, okay. One question. Okay. Uh, as already mentioned by Dr. Arun Kumar, uh, as per the Bedrosian classification, if we have or if we do not have adequate bone in the zone 2 and zone 3s of the maxilla with just bone in the zone 1, which is the anterior maxilla, then we are left with no other choice to do a zygomatic implants in the posterior maxilla. So that becomes an absolute indication. There's no bone in the premolar and the molar region. So that means we have no other choice other than to go for a zygomatic implants. And uh, coming to know how we are going in the direct, uh, correct angulation, see zygomatic implants are not a blind procedure. We normally uh, uh, rise a mucoperiosteal flap, we visualize the zygoma and uh, after looking at the zygoma, we go uh, in, we decide the angulation of the implant. So it's not like pterygoid implants where it is a blind procedure. So you may not know what angulation you're going in. But when it comes to zygomatic implant, because we visualize and do it, there shouldn't be a problem. For better understanding of the angulation intraoperatively, I would uh, suggest you can go for a stereolithographic model uh, prior to going in for the surgery, understand the anatomy of the zygoma, so that way, it will be very helpful for you to actually uh, plan and position your implant. So I think uh, that answers that question, sir. Hello, sir. I think uh, because of your video got disconnected, I was answering some of the questions. Okay, okay. I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. I just got off wire. So we've uh, come to the end of the uh, session, sir. We've almost answered all of these questions. So, Jimson, sir, how do I move on to the next? Uh... Yeah, yeah, you can. I think that Naveen is there in the room already. Okay, so... Dr. Naveen is? Yes, sir, we could, we could move on to the next session. Okay. Yeah. Dr. Sender, please continue. Yes, sir. So, it's again a great pleasure to join you on the second half of the session on salivary glands and maxillary sinus with one of uh, the very hilarious uh, maxillofacial surgeons of Tamil Nadu Pondicherry chapter, Dr. Naveen. Uh, so I welcome you, uh, Dr. Naveen, sir, to come and join uh, this uh, session to answer some of the questions on the topic. So Naveen, sir, are you there? I'm not yeah, yeah, sure. Hello. Uh, hello. Good evening. Welcome, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Jensen, Dr. Elevenil, for dragging me into this, and Dr. Hendel for preparing my slides. Uh, thank you so much. It's a uh, it's a good variety of choices just to give some masala to it and implants on one side and uh, maxillary and salary glands on the other side yes sir so and let's move on to the you. yeah thank you sir let's move on to the questions on uh, maxillary sinus to start with so the first question is about indications for intranasal antrostomy intranasal as uh, yeah, yeah, yeah intranasal antrostomy is more of a tongue twister in my mouth, I guess. Intranasal antrostomy, see, let us understand what intranasal antrostomy basically means. Intranasal antrostomy is basically uh, creating a communication between the antrum and the nose. Now, if you've studied your anatomy well, you will be asking me, there is already a communication in the middle matrix. So why do you want to create one more communication? Now, it is because the maxillary sinus, you know, communicates through the nasal cavity. To the middle meatus. Am I audible, Sanjay? 
Yes, sir. Absolutely. You can. Macular sinus basically it communicates to the nasal cavity through the middle bladders, and if for some reason it has to get infected and collect pus, it has to fill up all the way up to the middle bladders, and only then it can drain, which is not favorable for us. So for a practical and more easy drainage, we end up creating a, a communication through the nasal cavity at a much lower level. That is why we end up creating a small perforation at the inferior matters yes. for uh, uh, that's called antrostomy, intranasal antrostomy. Okay. okay. So you can see in this picture clearly that the millimeters is the one which is normally communicated and you want to create an opening in which uh, any other side. Yeah. So uh, if I have to tell this in English, it is basically uh, to allow unobstructed mucociliary flow to restore sinus ventilation, drainage, and mucociliary clearance. It can be done either by endoscopic approach or in combination at the end of uh, caldwell operation. So yeah. the next question is about oroantral fistula. And the question is, which, which is the best technique for closure? Yeah, best technique. Uh, so before, before I answer this uh, question, I'll give you a small piece of advice to uh, all the young surgeons or postgraduates here. In your surgical career, uh, take this as the last time. I don't know who asked this question. Take this as your last time. Never, ever, ever ask which is the best technique to handle a particular problem. Because what is best uh, previously may not be best now. What is best now may not be best uh, sometime later. So there's nothing absolutely. called uh, best technique. Yes, Anthony? Yes, sir. Absolutely. I'm right. talking about this quite frequently. So, so let's quickly tell you what noroantral. Uh, communication literally is. Oroantral fistula is basically a, a communication which has uh, become chronic. So in other words, if it is epithelized, then it becomes an oroantral fistula. Normally, uh, oroantral communications which are uh, lesser than 2 millimeters in diameter will heal spontaneously without any form of uh, surgical intervention. Whereas if you have a bigger uh, communication, you will end up uh, requiring an intervention. So how do you decide on how to treat this? The factors that help you deciding this are uh, the size of the communication, uh, your time at which you are diagnosing this, uh, presence or absence of infection, and the particular surgeon's expertise. Okay, you decide this based on these two factors. Now, coming to how you uh, so so this is a nice uh, protocol that the uh, center has made. So, how do you decide? Deciding a flat treatment plan based on the duration of oroantral communication. If you have recent communication, okay, it's called a communication. Recent oroantral uh, opening is called a communication, whereas those which is longer than 48 hours and more long standing will be called as an oroantral fistula or a chronic fistula accordingly. Now, the only difference in between these two is that if for a longer standing case, where in which it becomes a fistula, you have to concentrate on excision of the vestibular epithelial sinus tract and then provide for drainage and aeration of the macular sinus. So that is the difference how you do it. Coming to the management based on the size of the perforation, you know, if you have a perforation, perforation which is less than five millimeters, come to the next thing thinking about the location, where exactly it is. Is it lateral or in the premolar or edentulous? Uh, areas. So these are the things which, that help you design. If you have a perforation of less than five millimeters at lateral or mid alveolar area or the premolar area, then start thinking whether you have sufficient vestibular depth. If there is vestibular depth, go for always go for a buccal plaque, buccal advancement plaque. If there is a sufficient vestibular depth in the lateral mid alveolar or premolar areas, go for buccal advancement plaque. Whereas if there's no sufficient uh, vestibular depth, go for a bone graft, free mucosal graft, subepithelial connective tissue grafts, so whatever. And, if, and the same thing if it happens in an edentulous area, go for a muxar flap. Then it is nothing but a butter flap, which is laterally, mediolaterally mobilized. Okay, anthroposterior sliding flap is called the muxar flap. It is preferably better for uh, an edentulous uh, oriental communication. Now let's move on to the next uh, situation where in the perforation seems to be slightly bigger. So if the perforation is more than five millimeters, again, the same next uh, question should be where exactly is the perforation? If the perforation is in the third molar area, go for a palatal rotation at once flap, or if it's somewhere in the middle, in the premolars or the molar region, go for the 
and start thinking whether if you have sufficient uh, vestibular depth. Like I told you the previous uh, slide itself, if you have sufficient vestibular depth, always go for buckle flap, either a buckle flap or a buckle pad pad flap. But if you don't have sufficient vestibular depth, think about a palatal flap. So the point is sufficient vestibular depth or not, Palatal flaps always reserved for uh, uh, communications which are slightly bigger, almost about 10 millimeters. Palatal flap is a good option. So the point that you're trying to make here is the deciding point is a vestibular depth. Whether we are going vestibular depth, or yeah, or buckle flap. Yeah, flap. vestibular depth, go for buckle flap. Large oh. uh, perforations, go for palatal flap. Uh, that's how, that's the things that you need to remember. Okay, okay. Sir. Less than two millimeters, don't bother. Okay. So the next question is about the silolith investigation and management. Yeah, silolith. Uh, siloliths uh, are uh, investigation and you know, basically so siloliths are basically salivary gland calculi. Uh, what happens is because you know it happens due to the stasis of flow, infection, and alteration of the duct contents. Uh, these calcified stones are basically formed by the precipitation of salts around the nidus of mucus plugs, epithelial cells, and microorganisms. So uh, you must be knowing, you know, if you've seen uh, enough cases, you will understand that 80% of the siloliths invariably occur, occur in the uh, submandibular gland. You know the reason because the contents of the uh, texture, I mean, uh, uh, nature of submandibular salivary secretion, and also the tortuous course of the submandibular duct. Because of these two reasons, 80% of the siloliths end up occurring in the uh, submandibular gland. Mm. Oh. Yeah, so uh, how do you manage this? Uh, so you, so I also have to add some more. So, uh, investigation, like investigation, I'll tell you some more uh, things about investigation. So what happens is about 80 to 90%, I read somewhere that 80 to 90% of them invariably show up on the X-ray. So the X-ray invariably have to precede a silography or any form of invasive investigation. Almost most of them show up on the X-ray itself. And uh, if you have to move on to silography, start thinking about water soluble, non-ionic, non-ionic iodine preferred. Okay. So in general, in general, the preferred mode of investigation, uh, uh, the Americans basically tend to tend to be preferring unenhanced computer tomography, whereas the Europe and uh, us are more favor more in favor of ultrasound or digital subtraction silography. Okay. Uh, so, the next slide, so, the next so when it comes to silolith, they say there are two types of silolith. One is radio lucent and one is radio opaque. Ah, uh, the, the digital subtraction silography is a very nice thing to uh, quickly identify even uncalcified stones. That's what if you want to identify uncalcified uh, silolith, best thing is to go for digital subtraction silolith. Uh, Radiograph. Okay. Radiograph. Management. So non-management can be either non-surgical or surgical. Non-surgical management, and then you use those endoscopes, which are about 0 0.8 to 2.3 millimeter endoscopes are available. Use those miniature endoscopes, visualize silolets and remove them. Uh, you have to, you can either do an intracorporeal or extracorporeal lithotripsy. Uh, there in which uh, in intracorporeal lithotripsy, you end up using uh, shock waves, reduce the lasers, or hydro, electrohydraulic forces, uh, pneumoballistic force, you uh, silolith into multiple fragments and then wash them out using the same uh, endoscope. If you have to require a surgical option, it is either a silodocoplasty or an excision of the entire gland per se. Okay. And uh, yeah, ah, this is an interesting uh, uh, flowchart given by Myers. Uh, this is a thing of about uh, management of recurrent salivary gland uh, swelling. How you manage basically either a calculus or a stenosis is start thinking about whether it is unilateral or bilaterally and end up uh, do, you will end up doing a silo, diagnostic hyaluronidoscopy. For small calculus up to about uh, uh, eight millimeters, think of either a wire basket removal or lithotripsy and wire basket removal. You either take the stone out or the wire basket is like a, a small mesh which will insert into the duct. When you expand the duct, when you expand the wire mesh beyond the uh, silolith, it will open up and start uh, engaging that uh, stone and then drag it out. You can do it if you have a smaller stone. If you have a huge stone, get inside, 
do a lithotripsy, break it into multiple fragments, and then use the wire basket to engage and clump all these things and bring it up. This is about small and medium calculus. If you have a large calculus, you have no other option but to do phyllodiscopy or and in a combination of the surgery by which you end up removing the gland itself most of the time. Now, what about uh, stenosis? Large stenosis, no, again, you'll end up doing uh, surgical option only. If you have diffuse stenosis, go for mechanical dilatation. Or if you have thin, small stenosis, go for a small balloon dilatoscopy approved, I mean, a uh, health balloon dilatation. So, do you, ha do you think there is any difference in the approach when it goes to submandibular gland versus parotid gland? Is this uh, yeah. going to be the common for both the glands or? Submandibular gland, invariably, if the, the more proximal the uh, uh, phyllolith is, the more chances that you will end up doing a surgical approach, surgical approach and removing the gland itself, submandibular and sublingual glands. Whereas okay. parotid, you don't go for it so, so frequently. Okay. So the next question is about Jogren syndrome management by a maxillofacial surgeon. Jogren syndrome as such is never managed by a maxillofacial surgeon for that matter. Jogren syndrome is basically an autoimmune destruction of the exocrine glands. So it uh, primarily involves salivary and lacrimal. Now, what we end up managing are the symptoms or the effects of uh, Jogren's cover. We don't handle the Jogren's as such, isn't it? So, Jogren's, uh, for general knowledge, Jogren's can be either primary Jogren's or secondary Jogren's. Primary Jogren's presents with uh, dry mouth, dry eyes, and in more than 50% of the cases, the parotid gland enlargement will be present. Whereas the secondary Jogren's will have all the features of primary Jogren's. In addition to that, they'll also have rheumatoid arthritis, systemic lupus erythematosus, and primary biliary cirrhosis. Generally affects a woman of greater than 40 years of uh, or more. Invariably, their husbands are more affected than them. Uh, the diagnostic workup for uh, Jogren syndrome involves uh, commonly involves a uh, shimmer tear function test and a parotid gland biopsy. In addition to your conventional CT and MRI. Treatment. How do you treat it? Treat it like any autoimmune disorder. Jogren syndrome is incurable. Understand that. Treat the symptoms which happen because of Jogren syndrome. Dry eyes, obviously, use dissolve, slowly dissolving methyl cellulose. Uh, or, uh, or also use uh, topical antibiotics like sulfatetamide or ophthalmologic gentamicin solutions. The oral dryness can be managed with oral pilocarpin, 5 mg three times daily, or atomized water spray or sips of water. Caries control and topical fluoride carriers, which are preferable, which are those which are commonly used in irradiated patients. So the same thing we can use here also. Nystatal oral suspensions, which switch and swallow types, they can be used to control candida colonization in case. For about the so so for about six to ten percent of the cases in Jogren's might progress to lymphoma of the parotid. Now the three things that we have to concentrate in a Jogren syndrome is dry eyes, dry mouth and the possibility of salivary gland uh, lymphoma. If you end up uh, diagnosing a salivary gland lymphoma, then this will require radiotherapy of about 5,000 to 6,000 centigrade and reserve uh, chemotherapy for end stage uh, disorders like stage three and stage four lymphomas. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So the next question is, uh, what are the procedures to retrieve a tooth or a root mm -hmm. from the maxillary sinus? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Retrieve a tooth, you can only retrieve it through either uh, the extraction socket itself or do a separate calvo loop or endoscopic uh, method to gain access into the sinus and then retrieve it. So now more often than the roots, now people are retrieving more implants from the... Implants the from the sinus than yeah. the roots. <laughs> yeah. So next question is about calvo lock procedure, uh, indications and steps involved. Yes. Caldo look. Caldo look is basically an operation originally described in the early 19, 18th century. Uh, it's just basically, in a, basically an index finger site opening into the maxillary sinus for whatever the uh, purpose that you are gaining access to. You end up doing exposing it to the labigingal sulcus along the canine fossa that gives the easiest access to it. Okay. 
so uh, in the indications commonest indication shall be chronic macular sinus retrieval of roots removal of cysts or mucosils from the sinus uh, what do you do you do a, you, uh, place a 3 mm uh, place an incision of about 3.5 to 4 cm at about 3 mm above mucogingival lung uh, joint like elevate this mucopriosum over the canine fossa all the way up to the infrabody foramen and uh, make sure you don't injure the nerve once you expose the anterior wall of the maxilla you create an opening on the canine fossa uh, the using a chisel mallet or a cutting bar the ultimate eventual size of the bony uh, opening should be the size of about an index finger so that you end up uh, uh, inserting an instrument uh, to retrieve or a drain pus or whatever the reason you gained access into the sinus box right yeah now yeah then this is what we spoke last time uh, in association with that uh, intranasal antrostomy right? once you gain access into the uh, sinus and do whatever procedure you came there for when you start and then start packing the sinus you may pack the sinus cavity with a single long ribbon gauze which will be soaked in an antibiotic uh, ointment and the free end should be coming out through the inferior nasal antrostomy uh, either for humus or I mean, both for humus stages and infection control then you switch to the sublingual infection so how many days normally you retain a pack inside the sinus and when do you normally take out from the intranasal antrostomy basically 48 hours if it depends on what you are using if you are using an antibiotic pack so for you can take it out in 48 hours because it is used for humus stages most of the times you don't want a hematoma to get keep collecting inside okay that's what it's used for after 48 hours you can take it out Once oh. it, uh, you are anticipating some moment, it depends whether you want to leave the antrostomy to epithelize permanently, or you don't mind closing it. If you don't mind closing it, you just take it off in 48 hours and leave it alone. Okay. Oh. Otherwise, you may place a stent in this antrostomy site so that that epithelizes around the stent. Okay. Okay. So the next question is about benign salivary gland tumors, investigation and management. benign salivary gland ah benign salivary yeah benign salivary glands as usual you can write all the answers uh, i mean all the forms of uh, investigation ct ultrasound zero radiography ct salivary magnetic resonance nuclear radiological imaging and a uh, last resort you will do fnac especially if it's a parotid now how do you manage manage the mass and stone size uh, management you have to decide where in which situation should require 1 cm margin which situation should require 1 to 1.5 cm margin pleomorphic adenomas canalicular adenomas basal cell adenomas of the lip or buccal mucus or intraoral sites these are all excised with 1 cm margin okay and if you have to excise them also excise them along with mucosal epithelium oral mucosal epithelium and underlying muscle fascia okay whereas if you have palatal tumors always give slightly more margin 1 to 1.5 cm margin be it benign tumor or low grade malignant tumors they are always excised with 1.5 cm margins with a full thickness of palatal mucosa and periosteum uh, what do you think will will be the bony involvement of benign tumors of the salivary gland how much not bone... really and also only periosteum should be uh, should be enough periosteal okay. excision uh, should be enough okay we dealing with benign tumors la yeah yeah These, the, the previous slide was about minor salivary glands. If you have a, a, to deal with the benign tumor of the parotid gland, you have to think about superficial parotidectomy, or uh, even for low-grade, uh, uh, low-grade malignant tumors also, you can think about superficial parotidectomy, provided your uh, frozen section uh, comes as negative. Okay, submandibular sublingual gland, like we discussed previously, will invariably end up going for uh, total excision. Okay. So the next question is uh, about role of xylography. Yeah, Sandeep. Before I forget, in case if there's anything that you would like to add on, please go ahead and add it because you seem to have done so much groundwork for it, and I don't want you to miss out on anything that you want to convey <laughs> to people. Sure, sure. Yeah. Sure, sure. No problem. Yeah. Okay. So uh, xylography, xylography. Yeah, the role of xylography. Xylography basically is a radiographic examination of the salivary gland. it involves the injection of a small amount of contrast medium it can be either oil based or water based preferably non ionized iodine water based nowadays they are using that much i know okay so uh, carpe designed i mean uh, mentioned this in 1902 indicated for evaluation of intrinsic or acquired defects of the salivary gland ductal system contraindications 
we all know we've all studied this in bts involves contraindications involves active infection and allergy to contrast media uh the last point which is oil and water based contrast media are available both contain iodine and therefore are contraindicated when patients with iodine sensitivity so we all have uh, frequently read that xylography is contraindicated in presence of active infection could you just tell us why exactly uh, what happens when you inject in a patient with active infection they die it will flare up no it will flare up the joint the, uh, the gland parenchyma as well as the ductal system is highly inflamed and iodine causes uh, uh, so much of inflammation around it and the whole infection will flare up okay 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 where in uh, indications coming to calligraphy indications to evaluate presence of calculi to evaluate the extent of the ductal and glandular destruction assess functions of the salivary gland to check for fistula and diverticular and autoimmune disorder coming to the choice of radiography you can take out so once you inject the silo uh, silography uh, liquid the radiopaque uh, liquid then you start you can either choice of radiography involves op you can you can either take an opg ap scan of tk view to check for parotid duct uh, problems lateral oblique view ct scan and mri so can you just tell me who actually performs the xylography routinely in in your department like uh, or, or any department like who actually performs this procedure if you have the ability to cannulate a duct then you can do it otherwise the oral medicine uh, uh, specialty is uh, happy to do it. okay because they have close proximity to radiograph and when do you decide on going for a ct versus a radiograph for a xylography like ct 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 is preferred more because it's less invasive no okay no xylography this is a radiograph for you know for xylography when you have an option for radiographs and a ct scan if it is if it is no if it is going to be therapeutic xylography then you can go for xylography itself if if you are if you think your xylography will end up washing off the gland also you are intending to use it for a therapeutic purpose also then you might go for xylography okay okay if you are uh, checking for a mass or a, a lesion in the gland then there's no reason doing a xylograph so if you mean like yes, uh, in radio opaque xylolith then uh, x ray should be sufficient and if it is a mass a ct the xylolith are identified by x ray itself yeah yeah okay that answers yeah okay so the phases of xylography the pre, it involves three phases the pre operative phase the filling phase and the emptying phase as a pg you must be somewhat familiar with these appearances or normal appearances for all these uh, uh, normal conditions or pathology the parotid normal parotid will look like a tree in winter submandibular gland will look like a bush in winter phyloadenosis will look like a leafless tree in appearance phyloadenocytis will look like sausage with constrictions in between and phylactasia will look like dots and blobs of contrast media salivary gland tumors will appear like ball and hand appearance and jaw grins will appear like cherry blossom appearance this is all more uh, poetic than surgical it will yeah. help you uh, uh, pacify your examiner in case he is very angry with you so the next question is role of silo endoscopy uh, silo endoscope silo endoscopy endoscopes have uh, become very advanced now as i told you this very small atraumatic endoscopes are available flexible endoscopes are available the maximum diameter of them will be like uh, 2 mm Uh, uh with the uh, accessory ports or ports for irrigation ports for camera ports for retrieval of a uh, uh, calculator like, they're all available uh it can be either used as a diagnostic or an interventional procedure uh, the diagnostic cylindroscopy is an evaluation procedure that aims to replace most of the radiological inv- uh, investigations uh interventional radio cylindroscopy alone or in combination combination with external surgery is the operation for obstructive salivary ductal pathology especially in a more proximal region the indications will involve uh, all salivary gland swellings of unclear origin including swellings associated with calculi strictures inflammation or tumor and other processes that may cause obstruction of the duct uh, it is suitable for adults as well as children there's no particular contraindication in terms of age but it is technique sensitive 
and uh, the presence of acute inflammation at the surgical site or especially the papillae uh, better not to insert a, a silo uh, endoscope into a inflamed area like any other uh, intervention in the procedure so with the help of a silo endoscope uh, we can also retrieve a salivary stone from the duct or the gland is it true power one even the more proximal the better much better it is but then it's still that's what back basket retrieval or lithotripsy combined with basket retrieval if that's a small stone okay. you pass the silo endoscope beyond the stone more proximally you go and then you expand the basket it will go and engage engage the uh, silo lid and then you drag it out or if okay. it's a huge stone you go proximal to i mean uh, distal to it just next to it go lithotripsy shatter it into a slightly smaller fragment and then start with doing uh, expand by expand opening up the basket it's very technique sensitive uh, requires training i guess and equipment yeah so your your internet got uh, slightly disconnected for a while so oh, yeah um adanalla we could not actually now i think it's back so let's move yeah. to the next question uh, identification of facial nerve during superficial parotidectomy uh, facial nerve yeah facial nerve will identify using landmark four things you must remember the posterior iliac gastric the mastoid tip radial cartilage pointer and temporal mastoid suture so if you uh, and you this usually identified using these four uh, structures and uh, what you do is once you identify the trunk of the facial nerve that will be used as the main anatomical guide during a surgery okay the parotid tissue will be bluntly dissected off the nerve from the posterior to the anterior and at the point that uh, bifurcates into first two main divisions and then into terminal branches so it's better to identify if you are planning to do a parotid uh, surgery uh, involving the uh, facial nerve uh, primarily better to start from the proximal trunk and trace its way anteriorly rather than starting distally and going towards proximal trunk Okay. Okay. So management of Stenson's duct injury. Ah, uh, mama. Yeah, Stenson's duct. Stenson's duct injury. You need to classify where the injury basically is. So one sickle classification, if you take. So one sickle uh, classification is like site A, B, C. Site A means the injury at the that at the intraglandular portion. The gland itself uh, at the or proximal towards the gland itself. That's an injury. you can't do anything you can only involve you can only do a closure of the lacerated capsule of the gland whereas if you have a site b injury it is uh, the one which is over the part of the duct which is overlying the masseter muscle you can directly anesthetize it okay whereas uh, if you have a site c injury that is more after the masseter muscle anterior to the masseter muscle that is more proximal more uh, distal uh, oral cavity area if you can manage to do direct anesthetization it is good if you cannot do it leave it on the distal stump and just open up the proximal stump and suture it to the oral mucosa and create an artificial opening there itself okay i think that answers a question so yeah. we've come to the last question for uh, the session okay. which is on the significance of ongren's line hmm. ongren's line yeah ongren's line is basically the line with the imaginary line drawn uh between the medial cancers of the eye and the angle of the mandible this divides maxillary sinus pathologies into supra structural uh, supra uh, ongerens lines and infra ongerens lines and uh, those tumors which have arise anything so if so as you can see the lateral view of the skull shows a uh, uh, line drawn from the medial cancers to the angle of the mandible any tumor with in a ct scan or an x ray lateral skull if you show uh, superior to the ongeren line is supposed to be having very poor prognosis for those tumors which arise inferior to this will have Uh, much uh, uh, good uh, good prognosis uh, because of the proximity of the skull base in any structures any tumor superior to ongren's line so uh, that's it i think uh, there are some more questions that have come up in the various portals so yeah, yeah. can i ask you some more questions yeah yeah go ahead. yeah okay so the first question is treatment of parotid duct stone as per location This yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, so the more distal it is, the more easier it is to handle because it's towards oral cavity. And uh, that's what we discussed, no? Uh, the site A B C. Site A B C. If it yeah. is A, it is close to uh, the. It's more intraglandular. Don't do anything. You can't do anything. Just to suture the parotid capsule will be fine. 
if it is b it is over the masseter the course anti uh, on the masseter if it is c it is inside the oral cavity because it already transfers the message uh, tip towards the uh, around the message and it enters into the oral cavity so depending on where it is you end up either a direct anastomosis directly anastomosing it or creating an artificial opening from the proximal aspect itself okay so the next question is uh, elaborate on the role of ct scans in salivary gland benign tumors ct scans uh, see uh, some of we seem to be following Uh, more of ultrasound or MRI for salivary tumors. Okay, okay. But much much preferable than CT. CT. Uh, okay. Yeah. Being a soft tissue tumor, yes. Um, okay. So next is indications of radiotherapy in salivary gland malignant tumors. Mm -hmm. I'm not the right person to answer this because I don't do malignant tumors. Okay. So then, next is uh, what is silo docoplasty? Silo docoplasty, you should answer that. Yeah, uh, I I did not get you. Silo docoplasty. Right, answer the silo docoplasty. Okay, and uh, there is a question about the two charts transversal flap for edentulous ridge for closure. Is it better than Moxie flap? Moxer flap is basically anteroposterior sliding of of the buccal flap. You just yes. uh, create, la? That's it, na? Ah, ma, that. For edentulous, yeah. edentulous ridge, yeah. Yeah, it's it's better, I think. Okay. When performing the intranasal antrostomy, how to protect nasal acrimal duct from getting opening, open or injured? Do it at a much anterior uh, location. Better to keep the location as anterior as possible. Okay, and uh, intranasal antrostomy at a location keep it as anterior as possible. Okay, okay. So, any special treatment consideration for cyst-like dentigerous, etc., encroaching the maxillary sinus, like any cyst in the maxillary sinus, any any special treatment? Ama, take a CT scan and see if there is an anatomical barrier between the cyst and the maxillary sinus per se. If there is a bony anatomical uh, Barrier existing, then you are safe. You only treat the cyst. If the if the communication is breached, then you treat it like an infected mite. Okay, so I think with that we've answered almost all the questions that was put to us. So now we shall pass it over to Jimson sir and Elevenil madams. One Thank minute. Thank you, Dr. Naveen, uh... for the, the wonderful. Uh, Answering of questions, it was very uh, interactive and very nice to have a chat with you. So, uh, over to Jim. Doctor, sir. yeah, one minute, Doctor. Uh, George Paul would like to is here, and Sir wants to make a couple of points here. Sir, we can. Sir, you are unmuted, Sir. Yeah. Yeah, this is uh, George Paul. Uh, Sindhil, it was a nice moderation, and Naveen, it was an excellent presentation. Thank you, sir. Uh, I think uh, everything was covered. I just wanted to make two points here because um, one is nothing was mentioned about FNAC as a role for in diagnosis for the salivary gland tumors, particularly parotid and uh, submandibular. Uh, I mean, there is a school which believes that um, you shouldn't do an FNAC. You just if you have a growth in the Parotid or submandibular, you just go ahead and uh, excise it, and then see what it is, and go ahead with it. I'm just, I'm just making a point. Okay. <clears throat> that I don't know if I missed it, but nothing was mentioned about ultrasonography as one of the diagnostic uh, techniques for submandibular as well as was it mentioned? Yes, sir. It was all mentioned in the slide actually. Yes. Uh, this is the uh, here FNAC and ultrasonography oh. both were there. Uh, Okay, yeah, I think I think um, ultrasonography is a very very important. Uh, you know, it doesn't they didn't dwell on it too much. Correct. But I think uh, it's inexpensive and uh, it can be used. And just one point, I mean, this is mostly from my personal experience as well as it is an evidence based thing. Um, the sublingual minor salivary uh, sublingual gland uh, tumors are about ninety eight to hundred percent malignant. invariably 
Yes, sir. I think it's a good thing to remember in clinical science. I know you have a saliv sal salivary gland tumor in the sublingual area. The chances are that it is uh, almost 100% malignant. Yes, it's a good yes, thing yes, to remember. Okay. Uh, unlike uh, the other minor salivary glands. I just thought, I, ju I just came to see how it was going. So it Thank you so good much. Yeah, I just thought I'd mention a few points. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the points. So. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for the comments. Dr. Levinil. Yes, sir. Um, so with this, we come to the end of today's program. I wish to profusely thank the mentors and the moderator for their time and effort in making this program super informative. Thank you once again, Dr. Arun Kumar, Dr. Naveen, and Dr. Sendil Murthy. And GP, sir, uh, for the special guest appearance. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> Jimson, sir, uh, should we go ahead with the uh, MCQ test? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, before that, I, I would like to thank uh, both the uh, mentors for joining the session. It was a great interactive session with both of them. And uh, thank you, Jimson, sir, and Eleven, and Madam, for giving us this opportunity. It was a very nice uh, thought process to bring such a new uh, innovative program in our uh, panel. So thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sandal. Wonderful, wonderful moderation. Thank you. So uh, I, I request all the participants to stay back to complete your MCQ test. I will just share the link with you all. You have five minutes to complete the form. Yes, you may start. Exactly five minutes. Until you can stop uh, screen sharing. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir.
Jimson, sir? Yeah. Our time is up, sir. Can we wind up? Yeah, one minute. But uh, you just have to find out if uh, uh, people in uh, YouTube have received it because I just got a message in WhatsApp saying that, uh, uh, asking me to post it, but I have posted a couple of times. Okay. Just a minute, okay. please. Should we extend the time, sir? Um, yeah, I mean, just for a couple of minutes because uh, there is a, a minute uh, delay in YouTube.
yeah i think uh, we'll close the session uh, doctor can we stop minutes. sir yeah, yes yeah first i will do sir just doing it so Many are still with us. They don't want to leave. <laughs> so thank What's you that? all. Thank you all. Let's meet again in the next session. That's Wednesday, eight o'clock. Yes. With Dr. K K Raja, Dr. Ravindran, and uh, Dr. Nathan. Nathan. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay thank you all good night yeah. everybody Bye. good night thank you sir thank you sir bye thank you thank you dr ilamendra thank you sir.